how's everyone doing today? Happy, happy day after Easter. I am going to go ahead and get started today, and today is going to be um, the first part in my three-part series. It's actually a four-part series, but, well, technically five, if you can count the intro and then the four steps. But today is going to be the first step in the plan, so... We are talking about creating peace for your sensory family. And I am Kimberly Cox. I am the writer and creator behind Journey to the New Normal. I have two kids, four and three. My four-year-old is SPD and ADHD. And I have an ADD husband and I deal with depression and anxiety. So we kind of have a thing going on. Our family's just a little bit different. So, in my blog post, which was actually a week and a half ago, something like that, my first, my, the first step to creating peace for your sensory family is figuring out the problems. And I'm going to take you guys step by step through all of these steps and give you guys just a little bit, some examples and some things, just, you know, so you guys have an idea of how to, how to do this and what's going on. So, we're talking about especially with sensory issues, you need to think about all of the senses and all of the ways that the senses impact your family. So for instance, and I use this one as an example a lot, because it's probably the easiest one and one that a lot of people deal with. I have two kids who like to be loud and a husband who does not like it loud. And so we often have times where well, we often have times where everything's just chaotic and out of control. What I do, what we do is have a louder area in the kids' bedrooms. They are allowed to be a little bit louder than normal. And then in the common areas, in the living room, kitchen, that kind of area, they need to be quieter. That way they're respecting everybody's, you know, personal space. And they have their own personal space that they can be loud and stuff like that. So that's just one of the ways that we can work this. Um, some other things that we do are things like food bars and um, letting the kids help plan the menu. Also having maybe a menu of sorts, you know, like maybe if you guys have ever seen like picture schedules where you use the Velcro dots, having a menu like that where, you know, you can add maybe two or three different things on it and let the child pick what food they would like to eat, what food they would like to try even, if it's a new food. So I'm gonna quickly go through here. Um, smell usually isn't a big one, although there are some kids who get very offended over even just the smallest odors that most people don't realize. So that could be one that you're dealing with. Um, and honestly, I've never dealt with that myself, but I could, I would probably say that finding odors that are more pleasing would be something that, you know, maybe you could keep something that smell that they enjoy the smell of and keep that around just in case they hit one of those not so great, you know, moment, smells or whatever. So, um, as far as taste, I have, my four-year-old is very... She doesn't like bland food, and she likes a lot of salt on her food. She likes not things that are necessarily super spicy, but definitely she likes her food to have some flavor. So I add, um, like, the nature seasoning, which has, like, the garlic and the onion powder and all that kind of stuff. And a lot of times um, I will put extra on her food just to make sure that she has you know, enough so that she can taste it, so that she can actually enjoy what her meal. So that's taste. Textures, um, tactile defensiveness, that's something that you can work on slowly with a child, um, just kind of desensitizing them to certain um, senses, or certain tactile, you know, textures and stuff like that. Um, but in the meantime, before that happens, you can do some things like, um, like with the whole texture issues with eating, we just kind of made sure that like 
Like my four-year-old doesn't like pasta. She will not eat any kind of pasta. It's got kind of a slimy texture, and that's a texture that she just can't deal with. She still has not been able to, you know, she can handle it in her hands now, but she cannot do it on her food and stuff like that in her mouth. It just doesn't work. So I make other alternatives. I will make spaghetti for the family, and then I will save some of the spaghetti sauce with the meat in it out and put it on bread for her, and she has like her own little spaghetti sloppy joe. Um, just kind of little tweaks like that. And these are things that you might be saying to yourself, okay, like, why did I not think of that? That is so super simple. Why didn't I? Because we don't think about the simple, because we're trying so hard to find the right answers, that we don't think about the simple a lot of times. We don't think about what is right there in front of us that we can be doing. So as far as hearing, like I talked about having separate areas, you know, one area where people, where, you know, the family can be louder, one area where it's quieter, having a quiet area maybe, um, which can also help with the um, visual stimulation, some place where it's quiet, the lights are dimmed, and, you know, maybe it's a tent or just a corner where, you know, the bright lights aren't, and, you know, they can maybe put a some pillows or something in a corner and just have that place where that child can get away if things get a little too loud or even mom and dad can get away if things get a little too loud so that and then also having the earmuffs having ear or the ear like headphones on that can help too so then we're going to move on to vestibular and proprioceptive and I will I go into a little more explanation in the blog post I'll link the blog post below in the description um, but basically your vest vestibular is more of your balance um, my four-year-old had uh, had some problems for a while with balance she's getting a little bit better as she gets older but she also had some problems with being able to like tip her head back. She still has issues. She doesn't like having her head tipped backwards like to wash to wash her hair. She always wants it tipped forwards and stuff like that. So that's part of that. Um, the elevator feeling and stuff like that, like knowing that you're moving, knowing that you're sitting up or laying down. Those are all uh, vestibular. And, you know, some of the things like some children need, they require more input than others do. So some really need to feel that like, like maybe being off balance and having to adjust themselves a little bit. Walking on a balance beam is good for that. Um, you know, doing things like, um, like I know there are some kids who love to hang upside down. That's another one that, you know, if you can provide those types of things for those children who enjoy that, that is going to help them get the input that they need to get them to that just right state so that they're able to function, to listen, to do chores, to do homework, to do whatever it is that needs to be done next. So there's stuff like that. There are some children who do not like that kind of stuff and those children do not have to do that kind of stuff. That's fine. You know, I wouldn't make them do stuff like that. I would just leave it alone and that's fine. I mean, eventually maybe you're going to need to work on balance some because that's a big one for like, you know, walking across the floor and stuff. But if it's not a necessary thing, if it's not something they're having problems with, I would just leave it alone. Just let it be. Proprioceptive. This is one that we have a lot of issues with too. Um, this is the body awareness, knowing where your body is in position, in like relation to other people, other things, um, how hard or soft you are pushing on something. So the children who color with crayons really hard or who write really light with a pencil where you can barely see it. The children who don't like to be touched and the children who, you know, like, have to be pushed up against something at all times. Four-year-old, again, she has um, the need to push on things. She'll push on things with her feet. She'll push on things with her, you know, her hands or her head. She's constantly, like, trying to burrow into things and having that, like, feeling that she's enclosed and, you know, kind of wrapped up or whatever. And there's some things that you can do for that. I'm going to be showing you examples. 
of a burrito wrap, which is something that we do with our with our four-year-old. Well, we used to do. We don't do it as much anymore. But that's something that we do. Also having um, places for her to crash into. Um, you know, like a pillow that she can crash on. Or, you know, I've heard of people putting pads on walls so that the kids can crash into them. Things like that. Also, then, on top of that is the the needing to be, like, the burrito, the wrapped up. I lost my train of thought there. Um, where am I at? Oh, and then the not knowing their own space. So, kids who are constantly invading people's space, pushing on things, and that was what I was thinking of, the pushing on the wall. We do a lot of push the wall away when you when you need that, you know, input. You push your hand on the wall and push it away. So those are just some of the things that, um, like some of the areas that you can have, you know, issues in. I mean, there's also areas like, you know, sleep, and there's areas the sleeping, the eating, Transition is another big one. So just some things to be thinking about. Kind of think about where you're at right now with the things that you really would like to see change in your life, in your family. So maybe it's getting out the door in the morning in, you know, relatively peacefully. Or maybe it's, you know, anytime you need them to stop doing something and switch to something else. There's an issue with transition. Maybe there's an issue with feeding. You know, all of those areas are areas that, you know, can be very hard for parents to figure out how to go about it. Because my husband and I have always been like, well, you know, when we were little, blah, 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 blah. And things are just, you know, our kids are not us and we are not our parents. And there comes a point in time when you have to, like, stop and try to figure out how to get through this because where sometimes the discipline and sometimes the, you know, okay, we're going to do this this way. Sometimes that has to happen, but other times it doesn't. And when it doesn't, it's much nicer to be able to help the child figure out ways to get through that in one piece. And it's also good when you do have to use kind of the more tough love sort of way of doing it. We're going to do it this way because this is the way we're supposed to do it. It's also good to have a way of helping them cope with that and finding ways to help them cope. And that is what this is going to be all about. It's going to be about helping you help your family find those ways to cope so that everybody can live in semi-harmony. And it's not going to be perfect, and there's going to be some days that are going to be bad, because that happens in every single family. But hopefully we can get it to a point where there's more good days than bad days. And that's my hope. So that is today's little tidbit on the Create Peace for Your Sensory Family. I'm going to be doing the next two steps in videos as well. They will all be up on my YouTube channel and then each video is going to be embedded into the blog post so you'll be able to watch it. Again, I'm Kimberly Cox and I blog over at Journey to the New Normal and vlog over here. And if you found this at all interesting or helpful at all, go ahead and like this here video and, you know, give me a give me a like subscribe so that you can see more stuff. We're going to be coming out with a lot more stuff. I'm kind of trying to figure it all out. Um, I know that at the end of this week, we're going to do a giveaway. So you'll want to stay tuned for that. And I am super excited you came here. Have a great day. Bye.